All right, guys, I'm Martin Hecker. I uh, was an opto dropout turned ER doc, spent 18 months with internal medicine, so I love this program. And uh, I am research director at, uh, at the EM program here. And we, a few years ago, decided to do a big database on heroin, and that's kind of become my thing that I talk to people about. So we're going to talk about heroin today. And I tried to kind of change all this up to make it relevant for you guys. I don't think you guys are going to care a whole lot about uh, Narcan reversal and discharge home in an hour or two. That's not really your bag. So we'll talk about some other stuff. And we'll talk about what heroin's kind of doing to the U.S. and our community. Talk about how to treat pain in these patients. And then with 40-ish minutes left, I don't know if we're going to get into much of the clinical presentation stuff, but I can share this PowerPoint with everybody. Start with that case, kind of get everybody involved here. So 22-year-old uh, Caucasian female comes in with arm pain, denies any trauma or injury to the arm, uh, says swelling, pain, redness, kind of has some chills, didn't think she had a fever, denies all history. Physical exam, a little bit fidgety, kind of looking at the door, maybe wants to get out of there. Basically normal physical exam. Um, always want to listen to heart on these patients. No murmurs for her. And then we looked at her arm and saw the swelling to the antecubital fossa. Um, this is a patient we see a couple times a shift sometimes. Uh, seems to have some fluctuance there, very tender, won't move her arm. What else would you guys want to ask her? Knowing it's a heroin talk, I can think of a few questions. So I, you've got to ask IV drug abuse history and Definitely once a shift, I call my residents out on do they abuse IV drugs. And usually it's how many times you have to ask them, three, four, five times, and they finally admit to it. We just did an LP on a guy the other day who had a white kind of 27, unexplained. The resident said he definitely doesn't inject drugs, and I just asked kind of in the right way, and they're like, oh, yeah, I, I clean, though, for a month. So obviously those people are at the same amount of risk. So you ask every one of these patients, obviously, if they have a big swelling in their elbow, definitely ask them. So we'd kind of do the rest of the physical exam. Labs are probably okay to get in these patients. And then we would usually image the elbow. And that's why we image it, because you want to know if you're about to get stuck with a dirty needle. A very common finding in these patients. So how many of you guys do incision and drainage of abscesses? Anyway, okay, good, good. I didn't know how much of that goes on. If you do immediate care moonlighting, definitely you would, you would do a lot of that. Um, so this is not one I would go in there and do an IND on. If anybody wants to raise their hand, if you think we're, we're talking abscess or aneurysm. So that could include like a pseudoaneurysm, a true aneurysm, a fistula. Uh, what about oh, this one here, abscess or aneurysm? Abscess. How about here? Yeah, on my screen it looks a little more red, but it kind of looks pale up there. What about here? Aneurysm, okay. And then this one? Aneurysm, okay. So the trick is these are all aneurysms. Um, and and I, have, I, I call usually call hand surgery or, you know, if I'm at Jewish, they're right there in the ER and I say, hey, come down and drain this antecubital abscess. I don't want to get stuck with the needle, A, or get into someone's brachial artery and get bled on. So be very careful. There, it's really difficult to tell. You can try to use ultrasound. You might see that it's a pseudoaneurysm. You might see a little fistula or, or early fistulization arter, artery to vein there, but just assume they are all pseudoaneurysms and assume they all have foreign bodies. This is a quote I pulled off some website. Uh, the guy had a blog about his heroin habit. I'll just kind of let you all read that. And has everyone seen that movie? What, Requiem for a Dream? Oh, God, everybody needs to watch that. They should show it to all high school kids. No one would ever use drugs. It is a powerful anti-drug uh, message movie. But it's pretty frightening that people are just at home, you know, heat up your razor blade, use a little rubbing alcohol, and cut into these. And again, they could be aneurysms. What's this? Poppy. All right. That's where we get the heroin. Found it many years ago. 
Uh, it hits your brain quite quickly because it's so lipophilic, and it has a very short half-life. The metabolites kind of last a little longer, but heroin goes away pretty quickly, and so that's why it's so addictive. Um, a lot of times it'll, it'll metabolize to morphine. A lot of drug labs use just morphine. We did until a few years ago. Now we got a little more specialized in detecting heroin. Everyone know kind of about the difference here? So a lot of West Coast heroin is black tar. That's more pure poppy plant uh, versus the powder heroin that's kind of pure uh, diacetylmorphine. Um, you have to adulter the powder uh, to spread it out, to cut it down. And the, the black tar is real nasty stuff. It's real sticky. Has anybody ever seen it? it it's, it's pretty gross little stuff. It sticks to the bag. People have it in. And uh, imagine injecting that into your body. It does not go well. A lot of people do muscling, too, of the black tar. They do intramuscular injections, which isn't very effective at getting you high. And it's quite effective at giving you muscle necrosis and hurting you pretty badly. Here's what all the stuff that they put in heroin. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this. Uh, one interesting one is quinine. Uh, a lot of the samples in Baltimore in the past few years are loaded with quinine. It's kind of their special recipe. Um, but a lot of nasty stuff can be in heroin, and obviously you're not buying it at Walgreens, so you don't know what you're getting. I think we all know kind of what receptors we're hitting here. There's a really good book, if anyone's interested in this, called Dreamland. Has anybody seen it? it it's written by a journalist who kind of broke some of the Zalisco cartel uh, bringing heroin up into the U.S., but really cool book just about the economics of heroin. Northern Kentucky was one of the worst places in the country. Uh, it was $1 per milligram, and people would just kind of use that as currency. If you wanted something that was 40 bucks, just give 40 milligrams of oxycodone. Uh, people would go shoplift all at the same Walmart in Youngstown and use, you know, the drug dealer would say, my kids are size 7 shoe, they want, you know, Levi's jeans, and the people would go shoplift all this stuff and pay drug dealers, uh, you know, kind of special requests to get their heroin or their pills. Uh, and it, this is still the case that Dayton and Cincinnati is cheaper up there. So we'll, we'll talk to patients at the ER where you get your supply. A lot of people go up to Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus to get heroin because it's so much cheaper up there. Um, we kind of got into this mess because we got so fond of uh, oral opioids in this country. This is a pretty neat timeline kind of taken from that Dreamland book, but you, you see sort of when uh, morphine sulfate continuous came out in the 80s, and we had oxycodone continuous. Has anybody ever heard of this article here, Porter and Jick? It's, it was a low-quality study, just a letter to the editor, um, where an oncologist said, hey, I don't really think opioids are all that addictive. And people cite it, and there was actually an article just in this year looking at the citations of the Porter and Jick, and all of them cited it favorably, you know, for the kind of 90s, and then now everyone cites it unfavorably and says, man, we really screwed up with this one. In 2008, I, I kind of drummed this up a lot, a lot at our conferences, but more people are dying from overdose all across the country and definitely in Kentucky than they are from motor vehicle accidents. Um, and we can, we'll kind of talk a little bit if we have time about various legislation we've passed uh, in Kentucky and then uh, even nationally. This is pretty interesting, just a little graph showing how people start out using heroin. So most people back in the day in the 60s these are all heroin-dependent patients, subjects, but most people back then started with heroin. They, their buddy was using heroin, they just began injecting. Now you see that trend has switched and most of the people addicted to heroin began with pills. And again, that goes back to the, the big push by Purdue and these other companies to get you to take oral opioids. There's a really cool article that breaks down by patient interview why people started using and of course no one ever thought they'd become an injection drug abuser but it can happen to anybody and it has been now let's see these are folks at risk for an overdose so quite relevant for us but also relevant for you guys in the hospital 
is anyone who's been incarcerated, these are very high risk individuals who detox a little bit while in jail, come out, think they can use the same dose of heroin and overdose. A lot of times it's older people, males are more at risk. And again, it's these long-term addicts who lose their tolerance over a period of time. And one of these times could be hospitalization. So you admit somebody for endocarditis or whatever it is, they are off heroin for several days, maybe you don't give them opioids, you know, praise to you for that, and then they go out and find heroin and shoot up their same old dose and die. So that's one good intervention point um, that we'll talk about later that we can really catch these people, say, hey, you've been in the hospital seven days, don't go out there and shoot up, you could die. This is kind of what we're looking at with opioids and heroin nationally. This date is a few years old, but this is a little bit newer. This is the newest I could find that the CDC's kind of got up to the end of 2015. And obviously the heroin spike is very concerning, which we're seeing here. And then this spike here, what, what is this from? Fentanyl. fentanyl. Yeah, I don't think tramadol is causing a lot of overdoses. So fentanyl is very big time. The, the authorities in the state of Kentucky are very scared of fentanyl. It's one of those kind of silent killers. I don't know if my overdose death in the ED took fentanyl. Um, patients don't tell you because they really don't know. So this is kind of the wave of the future of what danger people are getting themselves into is uh, fentanyl in their drug supply. So Kentucky, we needed to admit we had a problem. These are drug overdoses a few years ago. And so we have kind of three solutions that we've looked at in Kentucky, but also nationally. Number one, stop getting people addicted to opioids. So that was the point of House Bill 1. And that's changed my practice quite a bit. I hope it's changed everyone else's. So it was, you know, we have to run a CASPER on all these patients. As ER docs, we can't prescribe more than a couple of days. Um, it's a little different with chronic pain, but I generally don't think you guys are prescribing a lot for chronic pain. You kind of send them to pain management. First 10 months, we did see a big drop in prescriptions for some of the biggest, you know, hydrocodone, the number one prescribed drug in America, and oxycodone went down quite a bit. Um, but maybe the unintended consequence of that is heroin deaths exploded that year. The latest summary I can find on Kentucky data after House Bill 1 came from a study out of UK here. And again, we're seeing decreased prescriptions. Um, actually saw a pretty good in increase in buprenorphine, which is being used for MAT. Um, although there were still some problem uh, prescribers in small counties who were still prescribing just massive amounts of opioids. But across the board, I think most people would agree that House Bill 1 succeeded in taking opioid pills off the street. Uh, we decided to look at that. We took a six-year period where House Bill 1 implementation fell right in the middle of that. And this, we just got published in one of our journals this year, but um, we, we were really proud of how this figure turned out because it really looks like House Bill 1 jammed us up pretty badly in Kentucky. Um, the OxyContin reformulation might have made a little bit of a difference, but if you can, can everybody understand this graph? We're looking at heroin here, opioid here. And so they crisscrossed paths right about at the time House Bill 1 was implemented. But the truth to that is if you kind of break it down statistically is that this happened before House Bill 1. So a lot of things go into this. There's a great New England Journal article about why everyone decided to start switching to heroin. And a lot of it, again, is the economics. It's just way cheaper to inject heroin than to take pills. So it probably was starting a little bit in Kentucky and definitely nationally before we passed this bill, but we may have kind of flared it up a little bit, so now everyone's hooked on heroin. The age group that is most affected by this is 26 to 45, and in some reports, 26 to 35. And I feel like that kind of hits home with my patients. It's, it seems like that's the age they all are when they overdose and come in. Here's some geomapping data we've kind of looked at. Can everybody see the zip codes okay? We've got U of L Hospital and all of our treatment centers are right here in the center, and so it makes sense. A lot of folks who come to the ER kind of write down as their address, the Healing Place, Salvation Army, and these places. So really hot spot, central Louisville at 40202. Um, 
looking down here to like Bullet County and some other zip codes here it was pretty interesting uh, how it kind of spreads out. And this is just where people live who came to U of L ER for care for opioid related complaint. And then this is how far out our patient base spread. So we had folks from all over the state come to U of L's ER because they usually overdosed. We included some other complaints, but basically these are all people who overdose. Here's some newer data from the state, uh, 2016. And the reason it looks like you splashed heroin down from Cincinnati is because basically that's what happens. Cartels go up to Detroit, bring the supply in, and it trickles down I-75, and it splashes across Kentucky in that manner, and of course hits eastern Kentucky pretty badly, where everyone was already addicted to pills kind of touch on fentanyl real quick. Um, fentanyl, very scary stuff. We don't know how much is in it. Uh, you can buy a kilo of fentanyl for a couple thousand bucks from China on the dark web and have it shipped in. And then you just cut that kilo down multiple, multiple times and make a couple million off of it. Um, but if you don't know what you're doing, you pack one little pill capsule full of fentanyl powder that will kill somebody every time. Um, and obviously, don't even want to be around the powder floating in the air. And this is what fentanyl looks like in Kentucky. So it's really, uh, it, it actually was the, we, when we do overdose, uh, when we kind of report overdose components in the medical examiner's office, we look at, we look at all drugs that were in someone's system. And most of these overdoses are polysubstance. But now fentanyl, as of last year, is the most commonly isolated substance in overdoses. And, you know, it's, it's just not something we know is happening in the hospital. People don't say, hey, I shot up fentanyl, you know. And a lot of these folks don't come to us because they die so quickly. They just end up in the ME office. Kentucky has it pretty bad with fentanyl, a lot more so than other states. The West Coast, with all their black tar heroin, kind of hard to mix fentanyl into the supply. Whereas out here where it's a lot of powder heroin, uh, we, we're seeing a lot of fentanyl uh, get mixed in to cut it. And this is from an article that kind of came out of some of the uh, state authorities in UK, uh, just showing this is quite cool. You can pretty much predict when your patients are going to die from fentanyl and heroin exposure based on seizures by the police. So this little trickle line here is KSP, Kentucky State Police Crime Labs. So every time they see a little spike in uh, picking up fentanyl or up here heroin, we see overdose deaths. And they actually looked at ER visits on the, on the heroin one. Obviously for fentanyl, we don't really know when people are coming in the ER with uh, fentanyl overdoses and fentanyl related complaints. The next solution is just developing uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. All 50 states have them now. It's not mandatory in every state. Uh, it is mandatory here, of course. The data is kind of mixed. Uh, some of the newer data looks more promising, but it looks like just implementing a PDMP in your state won't change much. It kind of changes around which opioids are prescribed. Um, when oxycodone was Schedule two and hydrocodone was Schedule three, people just stopped prescribing so much oxy and went to hydrocodone. Now that they're both Schedule two, you see a little bit of decrease in both, uh, usually when people put this in place, but it's, it's not going to cure all the people that are addicted. Finally, the, the most effective way to treat heroin dependence is treat it as a health problem. Um, treat addiction as an actual medical disease and, and don't just incarcerate everybody. Uh, Medication-assisted therapy. Any, anyone work in a Suboxone clinic? Anybody moonlight in them? Some of my partners at Jewish moonlight in Suboxone clinics, and you know, generally the idea is to start them on Suboxone and taper it and get them off the drug. But I just had a patient the other day who had been on for four years and was very frustrated that her clinic was not trying to wean her, and she's like, you know, just trade one addiction for another. So there are different philosophies on that. The healing place says abstinence. Your cold turkey, get over it, Let, let's get you better. Uh, whereas a lot of the places in town do a lot more MAT. MAT is getting a lot of federal dollars now. 
So you're going to have more and more patients come in on Suboxone. That's one of their home meds, and hopefully federal, federal insurers are going to be paying for it, um, according to some newer legislation. And then this is just to look at uh, what our rehab centers are dealing with. Um, we uh, used to have everyone in these centers were alcohol dependent, and now we see this huge spike. As of 2011, you see the red line going up, and that's heroin just taking over. Uh, we talked to patients at the healing place, and used to be, you know, a couple people were heroin dependent a few years ago, and now they say about 90, 95 percent of everyone in the healing place is heroin and not alcohol. So pretty scary. Our Kentucky Senate bill, kind of called the heroin bill, uh, was passed in 2015. And anyone can prescribe naloxone now. That's, that's part of what we passed. And of course, it's over the counter. I don't know if you all have heard that, but you can pretty much walk into any Walgreens, CVS, and others are following where you can just get it over the counter and buy naloxone. Um, this billable code, has anyone ever used this code? You can actually bill for counseling on drug rehab, on you know helping the patients if you have them in your clinic. How can we get you off these drugs? And you can make a little money for that. Um, we have harsher penalties for drug traffickers. Do heroin drug traffickers and dealers use heroin? Anybody? They don't. They're too smart. So no, generally no heroin dealers abuse their own supply. Uh, whereas with cocaine, marijuana, you can dabble in that a little bit. People don't dabble in heroin. It takes over your life and you burn everyone around you and you wouldn't be a very successful businessman if you're high on heroin all the time. Um, the Good Samaritan law, folks who are around someone that overdoses can call the police and they'll, they won't be in any trouble. And then setting up needle exchanges, which came in hugely in Indiana uh, with the HIV outbreak up there. All right. This is national legislation that's in effect now. So the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act also was called the TREAT Act when it was going through Congress. Um, but now they're really pushing again for MAT. So people can uh, try to get more and more providers, not just physicians, to be able to prescribe MAT. Um, mostly, again, it's buprenorphine, it's not methadone. We're trying to go away from methadone generally. Um, once you've practiced this for a year, you can have as many patients as you want. So this is something for you guys to think about if anyone's interested in this. Um, so you can set up a practice and, and you can have a lot of patients on these meds and really make a big difference more so than someone like an ER doc who has no continuity with patients. Kind of tough for us to really make a difference in these patients. Has anyone ever had a hard time treating someone's pain who is addicted to opioids? So, very, very big challenge for us in the ER. You know, if your femur's sticking through your skin and you are a heroin addict, it's gonna be very tough to make you happy. Um, so there are definitely some tricks that we can all use. This is the name of the syndrome, and basically it's, you've totally desensitized your opioid receptors. Your endogenous opioids are not very effective now because you take a lot of either oral or heroin and with all these fun mechanisms now, folks uh, cannot get the same effects from opioid meds. I, I kind of say you can see this from the door. I walk by, you know, looking at a patient who's here with belly pain, non-traumatic, or even trauma patients, and you can just tell from the door that they abuse. And that's, again, one of those times where you just have to ask them three or four times. They'll finally admit, oh, yeah, I do. I'm clean for this long, or I'm using now. Um, it takes at least a month to get rid of this opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and it really, most people think it takes a lot longer. The, the withdrawal syndrome for opioids lasts six months. They have an acute, a subacute, and a chronic phase of withdrawal. So folks will have this hyperalgesia for months, um, and you can, you can just see it. It's very easy to see, and, and giving more opioids to them, especially if they're still using, doesn't help very much, and you've probably seen that. It's like the first milligram dilaudid didn't touch them. The second milligram, they're almost acting more in pain and, and restless. So we have to kind of think outside the box to manage pain in these folks. Benzos are key. I, I use benzos in burn patients pretty much every time. If you burn yourself badly enough, 
you get a little Dilaudid and some Versed or Ativan because benzos augment that effect so well. Um, ketamine is just becoming huge now. Raise your hand if you're using ketamine for pain. You guys doing that upstairs at all? Nobody? It's very difficult. Okay. I see you. Yeah. Oh gosh. This was an intubated patient? Really? Oh, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's insane. I mean, if you're on a ventilator, there's nothing you can do to harm somebody with ketamine. It doesn't matter if they have a head bleed now, we're debunking those myths. Um, intraocular pressure is debunked. Um, if you push it super fast and they go apneic, it doesn't really matter if you're on the vent. I mean, they're already on propofol, which is a much more dangerous drug than ketamine. So that's pretty crazy. Well, so ketamine for sedation, we, uh, we are much more careful with. I try to teach a lot of respect for that, especially with a fast push. People will stop breathing, and good luck getting a noxious stimulus that's strong enough to wake them up when they have ketamine in their system. It's pretty much impossible. We, uh, we'll put a traction pin in a femur, give too much ketamine, and just yank their fractured femur all over the place. They won't wake up. Ketamine is very strong analgesic effects. Um, and, and that's why we use low dose. So it, I, this is a conversation to start having upstairs, but basically we, I, I like to do 25 milligrams because it's easier to measure, but some people like a 0.3 per kilo. Either way, you just give 25 milligrams, you can push it pretty quickly, and they usually don't go apneic. I've had maybe two patients dissociate at 25 milligrams. If they're real hypovolemic or older, have no tolerance, they might dissociate, but usually they're talking to you still, they're very happy. Um, if they're opioid users, they feel a whole different kind of pain relief. People cry, literally, from joy, from being out of their chronic pain, sickle cell, back pain, all these people. You can make a huge difference with one dose of ketamine. And, you know, I think people should be careful with it. I don't think across the board everyone should just get ketamine instead of opioids or instead of some other options. But if they're opioid dependent, it's, it, you have a huge impact with it. Y'all probably can't see this. Does anybody know where it's from? So y'all heard of the opioidfreeed.com, Sergi Motov. So he was on MCRIT, really nice 30-minute podcast that Weingart did with him. And um, he, he actually just wrote an article uh, that was published a few months ago on, a sh on an opioid-free shift. He had a whole shift. He treated 17 patients in pain used opioid uh, one time to as a rescue therapy but his whole website which is just loaded with great charts like this um, is all about all these other ways to treat pain don't even start with opioids so this is not just for the people who are addicted this is just across the board not to you know start them out on a path of addiction um, so definitely everybody should check that out the podcast in his site there at the bottom is an amazing website he's put a ton of work into it these are kind of his Ten Commandments. So again, not specific to uh, people who are opioid dependent, but very effective uh, pain management techniques. So always titrate your opioids. The first thing that got him involved was he saw people underdosing morphine and overdosing Dilaudid. Everyone got a milligram Dilaudid, but they'd get two of morphine. And obviously those are very disparate uh, concentrations and potencies. So. I don't use morphine ever. I think morphine's dumb. It's uh, all the histamine release. You drop your pressure, you itch. How do you titrate it? An old lady stops breathing with one milligram. A young person's still in pain after 10 milligrams. So I use fentanyl and Dilaudid, uh, usually fentanyl, if I'm treating pain with opioids. Uh, next step is think about all these alternatives to IV. So you're upstairs, someone is in pain asking for you know, relief, you don't have to go straight for the IV. I know it's painless, you know, you can infuse it quickly, um, but think about your oral routes, your intranasal. Um, when I ask for an atomizer in the ER at Jewish, people are like, "Are you? what are you talking about, you're crazy? I'm like, no, let's atomize this ketamine, atomize the fentanyl, Versed, whatever it is, 
you get less euphoria across the board and still a really good analgesic effect. He loves ketamine. This guy's he's published a lot of randomized controlled high quality stuff on ketamine for pain in those low doses like we talked about. Um, talk to patients, of course, about follow-up and, and what they're going to do for their pain when they leave the hospital. Uh, he, he, the podcast is all centered around channels, enzymes, receptors. It's really cool. Like if you're if you're a geek into biochemistry, that whole 30-minute podcast is about what receptors can I hit? GABA, you know, sodium channels. This guy's given IV lidocaine to everybody for pain, which that Iranian study showed is quite effective for kidney stones, but. Um, he uses it for all kinds of stuff. Propofol, hitting other receptors. Uh, that's that's more of a GABA receptor uh, uh, agonist than even gabapentin is. Uh, but he, that's kind of the way he conceptualizes how to treat pain. What receptors are jacking you up today, and how can I knock those out and block them? Um, he loves NSAIDs. If you're not vomiting your brains out, you're getting oral ibuprofen, oral acetaminophen. Uh, so I kind of like that. And, we have one crazy cowboy resident who that's what he does for broken bones. And he's in the room right now. Uh, and everyone's like, what are you doing, Ferguson, giving acetaminophen and ibuprofen? And in randomized controlled trials that are blinded, it really does work as well as opioids. Uh, what else we got? So use non-opioids again. Uh, perform ultrasound, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. Do you all get any training on that? I know we got ultrasound going on a lot upstairs, but... The nerve blocks is something that's kind of even newer for us, but highly, highly effective. We've been blocking faces forever, but now blocking scalenes and femoral nerves. And I mean, you can do some amazing stuff. You can knock out a whole extremity and people, again, are crying when they're out of pain um, and you didn't even have to get them high. So it, it's wonderful stuff. Um, he hates long acting opioids, obviously fentanyl patches, uh, a, lot of, a lot of problems with those. And then he actually likes morphine sulfate immediate release. There's some cool, he has some cool data from studies, but also from forums where you go on, if you read folks on the internet uh, who write about getting high and what's the most desirable and oxy does this to me, morphine uh, sulfate immediate release does not get much euphoria, kind of in studies and in these testimonials. So something to think about for you guys if you're prescribing a short course for home, think about using morphine sulfate instead of oxycodone hydrocodone. Uh, real quick, we'll talk about naloxone. Anybody in here prescribe naloxone? All right. About three, four people. You, we probably should all do it. I, I have prescribed it, but probably one twentieth of the time I should have. And again, it's over the counter now, so people can go get it if they want it, but sometimes you prescribe it and folks who have Medicaid or some other coverage will get it when they wouldn't have bought it over the counter. Um, so really think about giving naloxone to all these patients. It's getting expensive. Um, price inflation and maybe gouging is becoming rampant with naloxone. Uh, since 71, it's gone up 4,000 percent. It's doubled since 2013, and I think that's on 2015 data. So it's getting a little crazy. We are trying to combat that. Um, in Massachusetts, I think the government sued a company basically and got them to drop the price by half. Um, so there are a lot of good advocates out there that want to get naloxone into the hands of, of patients. And there's a lot of literature coming out now on how much people are using it, you know, who uses it, what makes you more likely to use it. I mean, all this stuff, this is all conversations we could be having with our patients. And, you, you know, the devil's advocate would say you're not really saving a life, you're just postponing their death another week. And, you know, maybe that's the case. And maybe that sixth time of overdosing and barely making it changes their mind and they, you know, get into rehab and get clean. This is some of our data from that same big database, just looking at the, and I don't know if y'all can see the numbers too well, but just looking at the raw numbers of how much naloxone we were using. So we used it for 39 heroin overdoses in 2009 and then 2014, 270. So we just exploded on, on using uh, naloxone for heroin. And now we're using multiple doses, and this data is pretty cool. We're, we're trying to hash out how long you have to stay in the ER after uh, you've received naloxone dose, because the textbooks still say a whole day. They say, everyone, we reverse with naloxone, we should give to you guys 
for a night in the hospital. That's from, yeah, that's from Gold Frank's talks textbook. And if you went to court over a bad outcome, you would be pretty burned by not following that advice. But clearly, we'd, we'd be giving you all eight, ten more admissions a day. The last numbers I ran were ten a day um, of people who came in with heroin overdose. Is that, is that awesome given our ER or is that in the field? Yeah, we've got both up here. So by EMS was here. So these are the numbers in each year for each drug uh, that EMS gave. And then EMS exploded as well. They're giving a lot more naloxone. Uh, Orthober, he's the Louisville Metro EMS director, one of our faculty, said they spent $100,000 in 10 months on naloxone. Last he looked, which it's been several months since then. Um, so it's a lot of places are running out. Police are carrying it now. We're going to have some new data on police, fire, and EMS using it because now there's a geo track. Every time someone gives naloxone in the field, it's going to be tracked in a database and we'll be able to see all over the city. And you can kind of predict where your people are going to die, where drugs are being sold. You know, it's kind of one of those big data. If we could just synthesize everything together, we could probably save a lot of lives. So I don't think there's an easy solution. Oh, go ahead. They can't browse someone and they... Oh, all the time, all day long. Yep, it's, that's our first question. It used to be, what's the AccuCheck? You know, unconscious person comes in, you're about to intubate them. We don't even ask their sugar anymore. We ask, did you give naloxone? I mean, it's, it's kind of sad, but... And then they're like, no, the pupils were big. And then you give it, and boom, they wake up because they were also using speed or whatever else it was, so... A lot of empiric use. And you have to really, if you want to use it properly, give more than one dose. Because if, you, if they're taking fentanyl, they need 10 milligrams of naloxone to reverse it. So you multiply the supply that's out there and the cost by five or 10 times to get the right dose. And it, it's a problem. So I want to finish, take any questions, but just real quick solutions for you guys. Be suspicious. Ask your patients. Every febrile patient, I ask them five times if they shoot up. Um, they will lie so much, they'll lie to everyone in the room. They will finally, you know, confide, confide in you an hour later when you call them on it. Think about rare complications. Um, be smart with treating their pain. Use benzos, use ketamine, use gabapentin, use blocks, use lidocaine, all these methods. Think about prescribing naloxone from your office. You find out they use heroin and they're there for blood pressure, prescribe them some naloxone and don't prescribe them opioids. Uh, finally, public health, we kind of talked about what we're trying to do as a country, but again, this is a big time way to impact public health. We're losing more people to this than car wrecks, and that's a problem. And finally, you guys, are, you guys know about Centerstone and the core effort here, so we're snatching people out of the ER, trying to get them to inpatient rehab, and that's gonna go for you guys too. They're trying to work with infusions and people with endocarditis and, and all these folks that are dependent, uh, trying to get them into Centerstone for help, and they're very effective. I've um, got a million dollar SAMHSA grant for this, so we're going to be studying that. Now I'll just kind of leave this on the board. This I usually talk about in here, and this is probably more relevant for you guys, but basically if you have anyone with one of these things, they're here for cellulitis from shooting up, you got to think about all these other things on every one of those patients. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the patients who have an abscess in their arm have an STD right now. The females are prostituting themselves and need gonorrhea chlamydia coverage. You know, they all have little endocarditis brewing. They should all be tested for HIV. They could have TB, you know, psych disorders. It's endless what, it, again, your life just comes crashing down when this happens to you. And, you know, it, our snapshot in the ER, it's tough to hit on all this stuff, and I know how busy you guys are too, but if, if all of us can try to, you know, treat these problems that come from uh, opioid dependence, we can make a difference in these poor people. So anybody have questions? I'm just intrigued by the academy. How did you all, how did it become such a big thing in the emergency department? Did you all train yourselves, or? Yes. Yeah, so I, I graduated residency in 2011, and somewhere right before that, I got really into it. I, I fought with some of the sedation committees and got it built into our sedation protocol, and I was, I was the ketamine guy. And it was just because it was fun and new and Weingart's talking about it and whatever else. So that was kind of how I got started. 
Now there's just so much literature, any licensed physician can very safely use it. If, even if something bad happens, you can say, look, this is totally safe. Look at all these trials. I mean, it's, you're not being a cowboy at all now by using the, the low dose for pain. Um, if you're trying to sedate upstairs on a floor bed, I'd, I'd be careful with that. But if you're just giving 25 milligrams to the sickle cell patient, you know, I mean, they, they sometimes still have us push it, but we're trying to change that now. Uh, there's a, there was a new study that was great that they just push 25 or 50 milligrams in a 100 cc bag and hang it and you can leave the room, 15 minute infusion. And that's what Motob does. He does more of a 15 minute infusion and you have great effects and no one's gonna stop breathing with 25 milligrams, it takes 10 minutes to go in. So you're, it's, this is not some fringe concept like some like IV lidocaine for kidney stone. One Iranian study, I'm not too confident uh, doing that if they have an arrhythmia, which there were none in that study. But I wouldn't go right to that uh, and use some of that crazy stuff. Ultrasound guided blocks if you're not used to it. That's a bit of a stretch. But 25 milligrams of ketamine, you, you're safe doing that. I think medical legally, you're totally fine. Say we see someone on the floor who got eight milligrams of naloxone. What should we watch for? Uh, you know, do we need a pulmonary edema? Is one I've heard. What else do we need to watch for? Well, first thing I'd watch for is that when the naloxone wears off before the opioid, they'll stop breathing again and they'll try to die. Um, but pulmonary edema, Osler was the first to describe opioid induced pulmonary edema. Um, naloxone is not really the cause of that, it's more the opioid itself. Um, and so people can get that even without receiving naloxone, but the, usually that'll occur in the first few hours. So you use an opioid, usually you'll get pulmonary edema in the first few hours, whether you got naloxone or not, um, but it can be delayed. And so definitely watch those folks upstairs. I've had to admit a few people for that. And in our, in our review of the naloxone cohort, we found a good handful that got admitted and a few intubated for it. But those are your main things. Just look for, again, that to wear off it can take one hour, two hours, three, and people will just go down the tubes and stop breathing. I see quite a few patients not after the last few before you are here. Yes, position them, stand back, cover your face, give Zofran with the naloxone. Like as soon as we're tinkering with it in room nine and I hear naloxone, I just step on back to where the attendings hang out because, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna see some puking, you're gonna see some angry people. Uh, they're gonna be mad at you. And that's why I, I, people are like a little bit awake and setting a hundred and pleasantly just somnolent. And the nurse is like, let me give some naloxone, let me give some. Like, I don't wanna put this person in withdrawal and make them mad at me, try to bolt out the door. Plus, as soon as you give that, you're committing to observation at least an hour, um, really at least two, I think, safely. But uh, so yeah, you, you gotta be watching out for all those effects to happen when you give it. And it'll reverse other drugs too. So empiric use, people who don't have any opioids in their system have been described in literature where they get reversed with naloxone. Just because this is your jam, you might know the answer to this question. Okay. So from like a government standpoint, are we doing anything to hold these suboxone clinics like responsible at uh, like maintaining their weaning protocols? Because like you said, a lot of times, unfortunately, it becomes like a money generating Yes. <laughs> all these patients and they don't really stick to the titration plan like they should. And you said that there's a lot of money going into the MAT program. So, like, are we doing anything to hold those clinics accountable? I guess. I not that I know of right now. Um, I, we have some former partners from Jewish who have a clinic and one of the docs that moonlights there tapers everybody and she said a lot of the folks don't. Um, you know, it's a huge money maker, 100 bucks a week, plus you buy the Suboxone. And that business model does not do well if you take everyone off the meds. So, yeah, as far as I know, it's, it's not regulated on tapering. There are plenty of regulations. Who can prescribe, although they're expanding it, um, how much you can prescribe, what kind of license you need. The training is still just like 15 hours online. They haven't turned it into a month fellowship or anything like that yet. But for what dose you give and, and how you taper, as far as I know, no one's doing that. You mentioned needle exchanges. Um, 
you haven't, I can't hear, do you know much about like safe shooting spaces? They see, when you when you implement that in that community, HIV exposures go down, and usually overdose deaths go down too, because people actually not only are you less likely to use a dirty needle, but you're less likely to overdose because you're being observed. Um, so, again, it, it's like one of those. It's just kind of a band aid. It, it's almost like the chewing tobacco instead of smoking. You know, it's it's not a good idea to shoot up in a public place with your buddies but you are less likely to die then and get HIV then while we figure out how to get the money to get you into inpatient rehab because that's what works. Do you think there's any hope for that kind of stuff out there in the country though? Well, there's, I mean, money is, you know, we got a million bucks this year. The state of Kentucky got 10 million and our efforts here, we got 1 million and oh yeah, they're, they're freeing up money for it. You know, Trump went on TV and said, it's a national, whatever word he used, national emergency. Didn't do a lot right after that. It's more slow work in legislation to get some funding, but no, we're getting we're getting more and more funding for it. But and you got to do all that across the board. You stop the bottleneck. You know, you bottleneck the supply and getting people hooked, and at the same time devote a lot of money to the people who are already dependent. Um, and everyone argues over where to put that money. All right. Thanks, guys.